Let's uh, cover a couple of other um, abstracts that are going to come out and then kind of uh, drill down on some, some other cases. One of our quests, we talked about biomarkers, Fadi was talking about biomarkers, and you know, we, we know regorafenib is um, a complex drug. It has a lot of, it hits a lot of targets. Is it VEGF? Does it have other uh, activity? And it's not for lack of trying, but we continue to look for, for biomarker uh, uh, response. We spent some time today talking about that, Howard and I. So yes. What's, what's your thought on biomarkers? There was discussion of should we give up or should we keep looking? Are we doing the right studies and if we find it? Right. Well, um, as we all know, regorafenib is a multi-kinase inhibitor and uh, Bayer is the pharmaceutical company that makes it. They've done a lot of work. They've really tried to find an obvious biomarker uh, in the serum, in the tissue, um, gene profiling, expression profiling. All the data are not in yet, but uh, nothing pops out basically at this point. On the other hand, I think most of us who've used uh, the drug are concerned about how it's tolerated and how beneficial it is. So um, especially because many patients have difficulty with this drug, we'd really like to know uh, who might benefit from it more. If we could really kind of shift the risk-benefit uh, ratio a little bit, that would probably make the drug a lot more uh, useful in clinical practice. So the, the, um, the quest goes on. And one of those uh, uh, studies was looking back at tissue from the correct trial, which was the placebo-controlled trial. So they got some tissue, not a, not a whole lot, but a proportion of the patients, and they classified it um, by one of these classifications of six subgroups, the uh, Marissa classification, and it looked like the biggest benefit was in the two highest risk groups, what they call the high risk groups. Um, so that um, was about only 9% of the population, mm -hmm. but that population seemed to benefit quite a bit. So it's a very preliminary observation, but gives us some food for thought on how we can try to use some of the molecular classifications now, looking at the kind of um, subsets of the biology of colon cancer to help direct therapy. So that that's a good lead, yeah. I would say. And I was thinking, you know, the other, one of the themes of ASCO this year is value, is trying to define that and think about it. And, and biomarkers are not only good for patients and improving a margin, but obviously they would have immediate value, that the, the worth of that's there. Maybe reflect a little bit about that. We, you know, we've seen, Rich, there's been seen some changes around an EGF targeted therapies and um, and if we could find a biomarker for regorafenib, it would wax poetic a bit on biomarkers' impact on value. Well, it's fascinating when you look at the uh, late-line treatments in colon cancer, panitumumab, cetuximab, now ramiserumab, uh, regorafenib, and TAS-102. The curves all look identical mm. for progression-free It's, it's amazing. Hmm. Uh, and, you know, it, when the first curves came out with cetuximab, I actually was a commentator at AECR and I, on that, and I had a slide that said, wanted a biomarker. <laughs> and the folks from Amgen went home and found one. Yeah. Okay. Uh, and so we've been looking for another one ever since and don't really know what it is, but not for lack of looking. Uh, I do think it really enriches your value for a drug if you can avoid treating uh, a percentage of patients that have no likelihood of benefiting and have a likelihood of toxicity. Uh, you know, it helps us uh, be responsible in using society's resources yeah. uh, as well as in protecting our patients uh, from things that aren't going to help them. Yeah. Uh, you know, the whole era of molecular profiling, uh, I described to my patients as it's a shot in the light instead of a shot in the dark. Mm. Uh, and uh, I'd much rather shoot in the light. Yeah. Fadi, this is a tricky drug. Um, we want a biomarker. Um, we may or may not get one. Um, what's the right dose uh, of this medicine? I mean, the standard is about 160. I mean, that's the, the package yeah. dose. Um, one of the major barriers to the use of this medicine is toxicity in some patients. It can be fairly severe. What, how do you handle that? Yeah, the learning curve for practicing physician has been tough because for three reasons, I believe, once the drug became commercially available, in every practice there have been patients 
park that ready for something. And we had three things. First is the physicians who did not have the experience of titration. This is a drug that you need to drive, hold, interrupt often. One thing, even if you start at 160. Second, patients who were treated early on after the commercial availability were probably patients that would not qualify for the correct studies. And that's what, what happened. A lot of physicians burned their fingers, I think, with that drug. And they says, I don't want to. Another thing we did a study within a uh, review within the network is pay the physicians who had experience with prescribing sorafenib had more likely to keep their patient on regorafenib for longer. That tells you about proactive intervention, those adjustment quickly, and the most is what would be the right dose. Personally, I do not start at 160 most of the patient unless you have a stellar patient. Because you always can bring the patient, and we see them every week. So you can start with the 80, go to 120, and make your way, if possible, to 160. But if you give the patient the full dose and tell them come four weeks later, the patient would not come back. You know, they will send you the, the pills by mail and tell you thank you, goodbye. Yeah. <laughs> and it's a challenge, toxicity management. And what's even more challenging is we see now clinical trial of other drug being developed in combination with regorafenib. It's a bit scary, you know, when you see its combination with full dose or not taking into consideration that it's a challenging dose for all comers and we really need to uh, be careful at it. Yeah, but I, it seems like it's a real drug. It, you know, you, yes. you, you, in the right patient, yes. you know, you see marker falling, you see improved quality of Absolutely. life, people feel better. Yeah. And I think it's gotten a bad rap because of the low response rate or no 1% right. response rate, that sort right. of thing. Well, you know, when you treat very end stage patients, you're not gonna have a good experience no matter what drug you use. But this is a particularly tough one because of the fatigue and the hand foot syndrome and again, Similar to serafinib, it requires intervention and monitoring. You can't just say, you know, take the pills, come back next month. That's not going to work. So you need to really see the patients, be in touch with them, and modify their doses if you start high. If the patient is, you know, performance status two, then I often start at 120 instead of 160. And there is a study now going on with the ACRU group looking at the escalation, escalation. 80, 120, 160, you know, a week at a time if there's no toxicity. So that may be another way to handle it. And I think it's a phase two randomized study that sort of mirrors the phase three study, a two to one randomization. And it was in Asia, Japan, and it was done in earlier Pay, you know, they had less pretreatment, and the actual the curves start to look better. So the the more we look at maybe earlier lines of therapy, maybe there is more benefit. But it's possible. Yeah, possible. So so we have a study of fulfiry with regorafenib, a phase two. How's study. that going? It uh, it's one week of rego on, one mm -hmm. week of rego week off, off right. and it's I every like other that. week fulfiry. And it's incredibly well tolerated. I was thinking but every other week it, would be a good schedule. Right. For yeah, this. They, but you're you're also giving it the week not concurrent with chemo, right? Correct. So it's um, it's a shorter time and it's also the weeks that you're not getting the chemo. So there's a big pharmacologic interaction there. So people don't give the two drugs together. Yeah. And it will be interesting. We started within the network, the adjuvant regorafenib. Speaking of, you know, people are betting whether, you know, it's gonna be a no-no study or no, maybe will, people will tolerate. And that's after the completion of your adjuvant cytotoxic. Yeah. Uh, of course, it's healthier patients' population compared to the, you know, advanced patients. But the problem with the adjuvant study, I'm concerned, is the motivation of the patients. Yeah. And we can tell that from by analogy from the imatinib in CML patients. Patients can be on the drug tolerating it 12 years later. When you look at the imatinib adjuvant in the GIST patients, by third year, you have you know, compliance less than 50%. And that comes to the psychology of patients taking a pill, a drug to treat your cancer or to prevent. Your tolerance to side effects go really very low.